Okay, so now let's start. Welcome to First Tuesdays. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm Jennifer Fenson. I work here at the Washington State Library, and my colleague Carolyn is out on the road today, so I'm your host. And you've already met Jeremy, our technician, and Joe's also here to help troubleshoot technical issues. So if you are having trouble hearing or seeing what's happening in the room, please give a shout out to Jeremy and or Joe. Um, this program is brought to you by the Washington State Library and Institute of Museum and Library Services. So well, let's get a quick count of who's here. I see we have a few guests with us today. Thank you all for joining us. Please go ahead and type in chat where you are joining us from. So your library, organization, and city, state would be great. A lot of times we have people joining us um, from all over the country. So today's program is Legacy Washington, Bringing History to Life, and it's my pleasure to introduce John Hughes, the author of seven books on Northwest history and politics. He's the chief historian for the Office of the Secretary of State. He's a former trustee of the Washington State Historical Society. So it's my pleasure to turn this over to John. Welcome, John. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, some of my fondest early memories are of going to the library with my mom, and now I get to work in one that's just a real treasure. The first librarian in my life was also my Sunday school teacher. Uh, that was a wonderful woman named Rosalie Spellman, who became one of the founders of the Timberland Regional Library. Rosalie, however, was from the gatekeeper era of the librarians, and when I was a page at the Aberdeen Library at the age of 12, she was still keeping Peyton Place under lock and key. That was uh, for someone who was interested in English literature. Uh, Peyton Place may not have qualified, but I thought that was a hoot. Well, I, I got a call this morning, first thing, from a lady who works at the uh, Black History Museum in Kitsap County, and she had a, a breathless tale to tell us that she had um, tape recorded oral histories with a gentleman who had been in, a Japanese American who had been interned during World War II. And it, uh, I was just fascinated to hear the story, and she was so excited. And then she told me that he had died just a couple of months ago. So it, uh, if there was a slogan for the Legacy Washington Oral History pro Project, it would probably be we're all burning daylight because there's so many stories in so little time. The interest in all this has really been heightened by the uh, television shows like Genealogy Roadshow, Who Do You Think You Are?, and Dr. Gates's recent programs with celebrities tracing their their genealogy. So um, I think now more than ever, librarians and people who work in genealogy have an opportunity to do some of this just priceless uh, recording of oral histories. I'll take you on a little tour up here on the slideshow who we're looking at for starters. We've got uh, former Governor Booth Gardner posing with Arnold Schwarzenegger. We've got Bonnie Dunbar, uh, first woman in space. And this lady right here is Lillian Walker, who is one of the most remarkable people I've ever known. Um, Lillian arrived at um, the Bremerton shipyard in 1943, uh, when, right at the apex of World War II. And like a lot of uh, African Americans, Filipinos, and minorities from other parts of America, she thought that when she arrived, that um, she left Jim Crow and a lot of that prejudice behind. She was stunned to find out that that wasn't so, that there were a lot of old, unrepentant old racists in Kitsap County, and there were signs all over, barbershops, drug stores, taverns, uh, that said, we cater to white trade only. When we found Lillian, no one had ever done an oral history with her. She was 93 years old, and it was just remarkable, the story that unfolded. Um, the oral history we did was posted online on Legacy Washington, and then uh, converted into a full-scale book that's now in every school in Kitsap County. The lady I talked to this morning um, asked us to come and talk to students and tell them about um, how to do oral history, which is the sort of thing that we just live for. The, um, here we have, next over is Ken Griffey Jr. and Slade Gorton, U.S. Senator, who served on the 9-11 Commission. Uh, that was an oral history that led to a full-scale uh, book as well. It was really widely uh, reviewed and received. 
Uh, this is Jennifer Dunn. She's the only person so far that we've done a posthumous um, biography with. Uh, we had enough sources and enough material to do that, and she was such a noteworthy person for her role in the United States Congress and as a political trailblazer in Washington State. At the end, we have Willie Frank Sr., uh, the wizened father to Billy Frank Jr., he of the famous Northwest um, Indian Fisheries Commission fish ins uh, in the late 60s and early 70s. Here's Lillian again with her. Uh, she had received a this freedom this uh, Freedom of Information Medal from the Washington State Bar Association, a First Amendment award. The, if anything personifies what Legacy Washington is about, um, it's Lillian Walker. Because our mandate from the legislature uh, is to do oral histories with former members of the executive branch, governors, secretaries of state, former members of the judiciary, Washington State Supreme Court and the federal courts, um, members of Congress, former members of Congress, and then there's this wonderful, wonderful codicil that says that we can do oral histories with citizens from all walks of life who have made an important political contribution to Washington State, uh, political in the best sense of the word. Um, so it's Lillian who's just inspired generations of people in Kitsap County. We um, That was one of those happy occasions where Lillian lived for two years longer after her oral history was done, uh, it, it's just it's so heartbreaking. I read a statistic the other day uh, in connection with Tom Brokaw's book, The Greatest Generation, that indicated that upwards of I think 500 or 1,000 World War II veterans are dying every day. When I look at the Seattle Times obituary column on Sunday, um, it, it's there's so many stories in so little time. Do, do any questions already? Okay, we'll go along to the next slide. Here's Willie Frank Sr. on the on the banks of the Nisqually. Pretty amazing. Doing Governor Gardner's oral history was one of the most challenging that we'd done. Happily, he was um, he had just had two deep brain surgeries to try to alleviate the worst symptoms of his Parkinson's disease. The uh, they were highly effective. Um, and so when I uh, first started interviewing Governor Gardner, uh, he was uh, pretty much his old, uh, ebullient self. And we got, uh, over the next week, uh, probably 15 or 20 hours of oral history with him. After that, there was a hiatus because he needed to have some surgery on an ankle that he'd broken. When we came back, uh, I think it was three months later, mental diminution had already sent in and set in, and he was not the same as he was before. So the, this whole business here of uh, of taking advantage, uh, uh, striking while the iron's hot, to to record these oral histories and make sure you have the the gist of it down is really crucial stuff. Chris Novoselic in our next slide here um, is. Uh, pretty amazing person. Uh, I had known Chris from uh, my days as a reporter and an editor and then publisher at the Daily World in Aberdeen where Nirvana was born. Chris at that time was working the counter at the Taco Bell in Aberdeen. So when I became an oral historian, uh, I asked Sam Reed and Trova Heffernan um, if he could be one of the first that w oral histories that I compiled. And there, there was no reluctance because Chris had been a lot more than just a future member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. He'd been an activist uh, for rank choice voting and a number of other uh, initiatives to make democracy more accessible. And that one turned out to be a pretty remarkable tour de force. We went down to his farm down at Grays River in uh, near Nacelle in Wakayakum County spent two of the most memorable days of my life, uh, listening to a lot of great music, but having a lot of great conversations about politics and the way to make democracy more accessible. Here's another cautionary tale. This gentleman here I'm showing interviewing him is uh, former state auditor Bob Graham, who served for 28 years, one of our longest serving uh, 
county, uh, state officials rather, um, we found out as Bob was entering hospice that he had been uh, an aircraft crew member with the Army Air Forces in the South Pacific in World War II. And one of his last trips into the South Pacific was to carry the uh, parts, munitions parts for the uh, first atomic bomb that was dropped. Um, Bob was a tour de force. It wasn't just all politics. Uh, some remarkable stories about his growing up years in rural Grace Harbor County. He's, uh, as a student body president at then the fledgling Grace Harbor College, um, he helped lobby through the first ever bill to gain a state funding for the community college system. Bob died about a week after we completed this uh, oral history in profile that's free and online at Legacy Washington, as are all of these. Um, his wife told me that it was that he um, left this world a happier man because he knew that his story was being shared. We hear that all the time. Um, there's just so many stories out there, and librarians, I think, are are really well equipped intellectually and in in terms of opportunity to help grease the kids to tell these stories. Some questions, folks? Uh, you had the audio earlier. Did you want me to play that? Yeah, that would be great. I think we've got audio now of Lillian Walker during the oral history. Thanks, Jeremy. And that's 44, I think, when, uh, when James said, uh, shoot this drugstore mm -hmm. man. Down on Silicon Park, he and uh, some people, some white ladies from the NAACP, they came to the meeting and they told us how they, he had a soda fountain in there as well as a newsstand and he served the uh, sodas and ice cream and stuff. There was a school up on the corner and about a block away and the little coach girls or boys, little colored kids, if they went down and got an ice cream cone, they had to go outside, no matter what the weather was. But the little white kids could sit at the counter. In Bremerton, Washington. That was fourth and part. They had, and so the teachers found out about this, and so they brought it to the NAACP and said, we ought to do something about this. And that would be it. Is that the end of the clip, Jeremy? It is, yes. Okay. Well, that's just pretty remarkable stuff. Um, the the story that Lillian's telling is that um, near her uh, home, not far from the school where the where her kids attended, there was a drugstore run by this unrepentant old racist who'd come to Bremerton from from Texas. Um, and so Lillian and her husband were so incensed by what was happening that the, that the little black kids couldn't sit at the counter if they ordered an ice cream cone or a Coke that they had to go outside. And uh, she, took the, uh, she took the drugstore owner to um, Kitsap County Superior Court, sued for an infringement of civil rights, which was a, a landmark thing in the late 40s, early 50s, and they won. Um, so that case, in terms of case law, uh, in terms of accommodation, that was sort of a, a landmark development in Washington state history. Later, she and her husband, uh, who worked at the shipyard, um, lobbied the legislature, and it's then one African American member to put through the first uh, legislation regarding uh, housing accommodations and the like. So on multiple counts, this story that only um, a, a series of church friends and people who'd been active in, um, in social work in Kitsap County had heard. There was a galling thing to me that when I was finished with the uh, oral history, and we were getting ready to honor Mrs. Walker, I called the NAACP in Seattle and said, gee, uh, we ought to have someone here representing you because there's this extraordinary lady. Um, I got a call back a couple of days later from an NAACP person who said, well, we're still trying to figure out who she is. 
and I wanted to, to guffaw and say, well, I'll tell you who she is. If you'll attend this program, uh, you're going to have a real eye-opener because a, a lot of people, um, young people in particular, need to have their eyes opened about what their, their elders did. A lot of the questions that I get um, about oral history uh, are, are really the basics. Um, when I was a young reporter, newspaper reporter, I was carrying around a tape recorder that would give you a hernia. It was the size of a brick. And right now I'm looking at an Olympus digital state-of-the-art voice recorder um, that costs $75. You can get a good tape recorder to go into the field that will do professional field work for $50 to $100. All you need after that is a pair of lapel microphones and you're, you're really ready to go uh, in terms of technology. Um, I, people ask me uh, for my tips about doing oral history. And the first one is one that librarians know as their stock and trade, and that's do your homework. There's so many tools today that it's breathtaking. Not only do I get to work at, at uh, this fabulous library with uh, every newspaper in the state since the 1880s on microfilm and genealogical data on, on Irish immigration and, and you name it. Um, through your Washington State Library, uh, there's the, the Full Tilt Ancestry Library Edition that you can gain access to. Uh, if you're here from other libraries, Seattle Public Library, I'm certain, has that as well. The second thing that I tell people is that after you've boned up on their background in the era in which they, they lived, uh, we're doing World War II veterans now, so that's just essential to be really conversant with the, the, the antecedents of World War II. But if it's, if it's Korea or Vietnam or uh, civil rights, you name it, do your homework. Don't just plop, just, don't just arrive and introduce yourself and mic someone up. You need to make your subject feel comfortable and impress them with the notion that you really care about this important job and about what they have to say. And it makes a world of difference in talking with people, particularly elderly people. Uh, they're nervous about uh, talking often. If you demystify that and explain what it is you're going to do with, with what they say, uh, of course, get a signed release. Um, if anyone is not uh, familiar with a, a typical signed release oral history form, you could get in touch with us here at Legacy Washington. Uh, just online, just Google uh, the, from the Secretary of State's website to uh, Legacy Washington, and we'll send you a copy of what we use. But the, the, my third tip is probably the most important, and that's to ask open-ended questions. It seems like it, it makes so much sense. Instead of saying, were you afraid when aircraft all around you were being hit by flak? Well, the yes is going to be the answer. Uh, instead, say, what were you thinking when you looked out and you saw flak so thick that you could almost walk on it, and you saw, you realized that some of your, your, your your squadron mates were in mortal jeopardy. Uh, it's, it's just so commonsensical that even I find myself sometimes just asking some of those dumb questions. And the subjects will often bring me up short with a wink or a, a sort of the, the their era equivalent of duh. Um, it, it, it really is a reminder to talk, to get people to talk, lead your witness, get, get them talking about those memories. Right now, I'm interviewing a 91-year-old uh, Ocean Shores man, who, uh, who a German Jew who fled Nazi Germany with his family in 1937, a year before Kristallnacht, when the Nazis burned synagogues, killed hundreds of Jews, th imprisoned thousands more. And he, so with the outbreak of World War II, he immediately enlisted in the United States Army and his, his skills as a native-born German, nuanced German speaker found him as a counterintelligence corps operative behind enemy lines during World War II. Uh, I had not known this before, but one thing led to another in this interview, and he was present at the liberation of Dachau 
the Nazis' first and last to be liberated concentration camp. The, uh, it's the most gripping stuff I've ever recorded. I think I think it could be the best story I've ever told because there's in when you're doing when you go to ancestry first and you pin down who people are and help them them fill in who their ancestors were and the way things work. Well, the story of Arnold Samuels of Ocean Shores turns out to have this incredible six degrees of separation tragic twist. His aunt and uncle, who were on an ill-fated voyage in 1939 of the liner St. Louis, um, the St. Louis had some 900 mostly German Jews a fleeing Nazi Germany having greased all the skids and paid upwards of $5,000 or some $80,000 in today's money to escape Nazi Germany. When they got to Cuba, where they thought they had visas, they were denied entry. They appealed to President Roosevelt, to the Congress, to gain entry to the United States, and they were turned away. Well, Arnold Samuel's aunt and uncle, uh, we found pictures of them at the Holocaust Memorial Museum. Um, and it turned out that his aunt, Paul, uh, rather aunt Johanna and uncle Leon were also the aunt and uncle of Billy Joel, the the famous singer. Um, one thing leads to another in, in oral history, and it, it's just fascinating. Um, I'll shut up here in a minute and entertain some questions. Uh, but the fourth thing, usually I tell people, there's four things you need to know about doing oral history. And I'll always wait to the end, and someone will say, well, what's the fourth thing? And the fourth thing is always take extra batteries. You have no idea how quickly these digital tape recorders run through batteries. And there's nothing worse than that sinking feeling of looking down at the meter on your uh, tape recorder and find out that the, the last five minutes of some really great stuff may not have been recorded. I'd love to answer some questions. We do have an individual type in here. The question is, how do you identify non-famous members of a community that are of interest to interview? Whoa. Well, someone would say that Lillian Walker <laughs> was non-famous. Uh, there's so many stories out there, and I think that, that this um, mandate that the legislature gave us to find these people who aren't famous embraces, um, I, I can think of a hundred kinds of people who aren't famous who have important stories to tell. I grew up in Grace Harbor County. The timber industry has been in decline lamentably for the past 20 years. There are in Grace Harbor County a lot of old 80s and 90s timber cruisers and choker setters who have um, remarkable stories to tell. Uh, they're important to history. One of the best books I've ever read that isn't famous at all is called More Deadly Than War. Uh, I think it was written in the 1970s as a PhD thesis. I'm sure we have it here at the State Library by a uh, former Roman Catholic priest. And he went back, having ministered to loggers in Morton, uh, up in the foothills of the Cascades, and, and did um, a survey of, of fatalities and other grievous injuries in the forest products industry from the turn of the century, the 20th century, through the 30s, when there was precious little in the way of departmental and labor and industries oversight. And he concluded, that after all was said and done, being a logger, a choker sitter, a tree faller, a timber topper in the woods of the Northwest was more deadly than war. The percentage-wise, more people had been maimed and killed in the woods of the Great Northwest than in World War I, the war supposedly to, enter, to end all wars. So um, those people aren't famous. Um, Neither was Lillian Walker. Um, neither was Arnold Samuels. I hope to make him famous. In a small way, I think we made Lillian Walker famous. And, and to me, I, don't, uh, I can't think of a higher calling. Uh, following up, 
I mean the people who make amazing impact but aren't known to outsiders. So as an outsider to communities, how have you gained access? Perhaps the process of networking is a better way to phrase it. I've been struck in the nearly seven years that I've worked for the, the Secretary of State's office and getting to work here at the State Library and visiting small museums around the state, um, how, how many knowledgeable, and I'll put this in quotes, amateur, close quote, historians there are out there. And some of those amateurs are absolutely first class. Um, if they, if better than, a, than some PhDs, academically inclined PhDs that I've run into. The, um, for example, in Pacific County, tiny Pacific County at South Bend, there's a, uh, a, a storefront museum that's uh, pretty remarkable in the breadth of its artifacts and documents there. They also publish monthly as a labor of law, love, a labor of love, a uh, newsletter called the Southwester. It's we have it here at the State Library. It's filled month after month with so many indelible, important stories. So the what I do um, is first I, I contact people in other museums, big, small, and in between. Ask if they have any more uh, information about, uh, say, Black history in Kitsap County. Um, migrant farm workers in the Okanagan um, in, in I find or <laughs> since I'm talking to an audience that includes many librarians I trust librarians are amazing historians they know people they know stories in, in stories that they're itching to have told I, I in Grace Harbor County again because it's my home turf there was a gentleman who f could be found every week at the Hoquim Timberland Library handing out copies of the Communist Party uh, daily newspaper. And he turned out to be the most fascinatingly unrepentant old commie you'd ever want to meet. Uh, w one thing led to another. He'd also been uh, an itinerant logger. He had been a member of the IWW, the, the Wobblies, in, Industrial Workers of the World. And it all started with me being willing to take a copy of the Daily World, used to be the Daily Worker, and ask him about, did he think anybody was still interested in the, the dream of Marxist-Leninist, Soviet, um, non-Soviet, uh, idealized society? More questions? Well, I, I guess I, I just reprise this way by saying the there is so much material out there and so many fascinating stories just begging to be told. The networking now that's being done in Northwest history, in oral history in particular, between historylink.org, which is this fabulous online encyclopedia with whom we've worked very closely, with Densho, the uh, online encyclopedia of the, the Japanese American internment process. Um, there's a fabulous Asian American history museum now in uh, the international district that we visited the other day that's marvelous. We work with Mohai, particularly with regard to photography. We work with uh, blackpass.org, another uh, online s site. Um, and it's so collaborative. And to me, libraries are just absolutely the bedrock where all this starts to happen. When I, I often work from home on Thursday, on Thursdays or Fridays because I'm, I'm doing a lot of reading. And the Holcomb Timberland Library has been good enough to give me sort of an office away from home in the basement. But I see people in there um, all the time doing genealogical research, having important stories to tell. And I guess I would enlist librarians in particular, genealogists, others, to get out and, and do this, uh, this important work. I have to uh, tell uh, on myself the most shameful episode of not benign neglect that I've ever been involved with. Um, my uncle Charles, my middle name is John Charles, and I was named for him. He was an aviator, a combat aviator in World War II uh, with one of the most famous B-17 squadrons in the history of the 8th Air Force. I grew up, uh, my Uncle Charles lived in Portland, but we saw him a lot 
and I grew up um, as a kid who was nuts about airplanes, and he'd help me make model airplanes, and um, I asked him a lot of questions. And like a lot of veterans, he was reluctant to talk a lot. The uh, fast forward to the 1990s, when one of the last airworthy B-17s, uh, the sentimental journey out of Texas, came to Bowerman Field at Hoquiam. And uh, the city editor in the, at the Daily World in Aberdeen, where I work, said, gosh, they're looking for somebody who wants to take a ride in a B-17. And I was out of my office so fast, I probably left skid marks and said that I was going to ride in that B-17. So I took this fabulous trip right in the, the, the I, I was in the w right waist gunner position where my Uncle Charles he had dodged flak during World War II. We flew down to a story and back. It was just incredible. So when I got back to the, the newsroom and started to write my column, I called my Uncle Charles, who lived in suburban Portland. I said, Uncle Charles, this is incredible. I just rode in a B-17. And not only that, but next weekend, it's going to be at Trotdale near you. And you need, you need to go see this airplane. It would be talk about a sentimental journey. So uh, another week passed, and I wrote a column that um, ended up winning a pretty big award about, about Uncle Charles, and I got a call. It was a Saturday, and I was working uh, late in the office, and uh, he, he was not a real jovial kind of guy, kind of closed-lipped, and he was laughing. And I said, well, what's going on? He said, well, I'm in the emergency room. Um, I took a tour of the sentimental journey, and as I was coming down... Uh, to the to the tarmac, I tripped and I sprained my ankle, and I flew 32 missions right into the maw of the Third Reich during World War II, and I never so much as got a sliver, and I, I could have broken my ankle. And he, my ankle, and he was just laughing his tail off, and I I thought that was hilarious. So I wrote another column, um, and a few months later he died. And I had never taken the time to really sit down with my uncle and to record an important oral history. How important it was, uh, was italicized when I went to Portland for, the, for his funeral and memorial service. His uh, stepdaughter, uh, during the reception, ushered me into his bedroom and said, your uncle has left some, left some things for you. I had his flight jacket, his mission diary, his, his air crew wings, I, mean, it was, I just sat on the bed and, and blubbered because I'd been such a, a putting it off a fool to not record this. Um, well, the happy thing was that I got in touch with the, the 8th Air Force Association, which has a museum in the south, shared the combat diary. And his combat diary is this uh, pretty remarkable document because it, it pinpoints a couple of missions that weren't really well documented on the site. So um, legacy Washington means we're all burning daylight. We're all oral historians. And there's so many stories in so little time. What else can I tell you, friends? Uh, John, I don't think you actually uh, went over the curve. Well, if there's... I swapped it over for you. Um, you had a little bit more to go on, it looks like. Oh, great. I'll go back through the slides. That's a great way. We'll go back here to the start. Um, legacy project to sum it up. We'll, we, they say the Smithsonian is America's addict. Well, we'd like to think that Legacy Washington is our state's collective memory since 2008. Um, our subjects include these statewide office holders. And, and some of them have been really remarkable. We've done Booth Gardner, former governor. Former Governor John Spellman, uh, who built the King Dome and served one checkered term uh, right in the middle of a recession, uh, but did some really amazing things that a lot of people have forgotten. It was Governor Spellman who vetoed the uh, cross uh, the the pipeline that was uh, that they wanted to put beneath Puget Sound. Uh, amazing congressional leaders, judges. Uh, there's two great stories, three in all, uh, oral histories with uh, former Ch uh, Justice of the Washington Supreme Court, Charles Z. Smith, the first minority on the Washington Supreme Court. 
uh, oral history and uh, a lengthy uh, profile of former Chief Justice Robert Utter, who died just this past year, who resigned from the Washington Supreme Court um, out of conscience uh, over his opposition to the death penalty. Uh, also, former uh, the former Washington Supreme Court Justice Carolyn Dimmick, who is now on the federal court and senior status, but uh, Judge Dimmick's in her early 80s, and I think she's in the office three or four days a week mentoring a lot of, uh, of brilliant young lawyers. And then, as we said earlier, the, this uh, this mandate to find remarkable citizens from all walks of life, and I, I hope that's what you can help us with. And by all means, if you run across people you think would make a great oral history or profile, uh, let us know. Uh, my email is uh, John dot Hughes at SOS short for Secretary of State dot WA dot GOV. But you can just Google up the Washington State Secretary of State. Uh, go to the Legacy Project, and you'll get an overview of everything we've done. It's all free. It's all online, and how to contact us. And we're looking for stories. Here's Governor Gardner again. Um, one of the fascinating things that came out down the stretch was that uh, he had been active in the so-called Death with Dignity campaign to uh, allow a physician-assisted suicide. And when the time came, that his life was winding down, he did not avail himself of that. I think that was rather ironic given uh, how passionately he felt about that. Uh, here again is Chris Novoselic, Nirvana, now in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, um, still down there at Nacelle at Grays River, uh, and going to Lower Columbia Community College now with a mind becoming an attorney. Uh, he, so he's surrounded down there by pygmy goats and his wife's amazing uh, weavings and a fabulous record collection. And uh, of all the stories that we've done the, about important people, it, it, you probably uh, won't be surprised to know that uh, the most visited uh, story on our website is that of, the, of a member of the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Here's Bob Graham again. You, you can, he was. Uh, this is this photo that shows me interviewing Bob was taken about a month, maybe six weeks before he died, and you can see how animated he is, and I think that uh, how happy he is to be telling his story. He really was one of the greatest generation. I should have mentioned that a real inspiration to me was that I uh, got to be a fly on the wall for one of Tom Brokaw's interviews for the Greatest Generation series and book, and that was with. Um, a Medal of Honor winner from great, from Pacific County named Bob Bush, who started the Bayview Lumber Company, and it was interesting to me to see that uh, Brokaw, um, this charismatic figure on television, was so down to earth and asked such good questions, uh, and I, I he had a whole retinue of people helping him do the uh, the research for it. But he he knew his stuff. He was not working from notes when he asked his questions, and I I think that uh, really says a lot about his talents as a journalist. Uh, oral histories for everyone. Here's our Secretary of State Kim Wyman, who feels really strongly about this. Um, she hit the deck running in support for. Uh, for Legacy Washington. Uh, we were frustrated that the project that we hoped was going to preserve and give a real uh, important new purpose-built home to the, this invaluable state library that's our treasure, to the state archives, which are in a fallout shelter, and to uh, the oral history program. We got sidetracked in the fallout from the recession. We're still holding our breath, and we appreciate all your support to, to try to, to have the legislature understand how crucial this is. Uh, I tell you again that getting to work at the State Library in its, its group of remarkable people is, to me, just a movable feast and the highlight of my career. Um, I'm really excited uh, when I hear uh, that school kids want to do interviews with their parents and grandparents. I think some really important stuff can come out of that. The Wenatchee World did a project for Veterans Day a year ago where they 
uh, got some tape recorders and empowered school kids to interview um, aunts, uncles, grandparents, dads, moms who'd served in the military. And then they published them in a special section. It, it was really neat. And uh, I think we can all do that sort of thing if we, we team, team up. So please visit us, if you will. Here we are at www.sos.wa.gov Legacy Project. If you have any questions that pop up um, in the wake of our chat today, boy, you can send them, send them to me uh, or to my teammates, Trova Heffernan, who is our team leader, and Lori Larson, who's an incredible researcher. Any other questions today? There are a couple of questions in the Great. chat right now. I've seen many well-intentional projects started, but the follow-through is often neglected. Transcribing, creating digital copies. Do you have suggestions on this? Boy, um, the grunt work of oral history is transcribing it. Uh, everybody in this operation is um, is lean. We've used some volunteers to do some oral history transcribing. Um, with mixed results. Some have been great. Um, it, since it's tiring in, in painstaking work. For example, the oral history that I, I'm working on right now with um, Mr. Samuels from Ocean Shores, he uh, punctuates a lot of his comments with uh, for German phrases. I took a little German in college, but um, we have a former volunteer now working for another state agency who st is still so passionate about the project that she uh, volunteered to double check the German um, in the nuances of the familiar German and the like she caught uh, in the, the volunteers uh, are so crucial. Um, I, I don't know where you're going to have to go out and find uh, in your communities people who are willing to help you do that. I museums, libraries, museums, uh, the Polson Museum in Hoquim in particular has an incredible uh, group of volunteers. And I know uh, that John Larson and others there have, have, have got some meaningful transcribing done. The, um, the, I find that um, the technical issues um, that librarians uh, and others at museums are plenty knowledgeable enough to, uh, to, to know how to make digital copies or give suggestions to you. Um, I'm sure that uh, if, if you talk to our staff here at the State Library, they would have some tips for you on, on the nuances of, of saving you know, those, those materials. Um, I missed an earlier question. Do you have anything from Japanese who interned during World War II? Well, there's this heartbreaking story that started my morning with the, the lady from Kitsap County who said that they'd uh, tape recorded this gentleman who then died a few weeks later. Uh, it's always preferable to be, at least we have that material. Um, we are looking right now for um, a, a Japanese internment um, veteran. Many of those, by the way, many of the young men who were interned uh, fought in World War II. I was interested to find in researching um, the participation of uh, Jewish Americans in the military. There's a, uh, a couple of fabulous new books uh, out. One is called GI Jews. The other is Why the Germans, Why the Jews. Um, the but GI Jews and uh, documents the fact that Jewish Americans, who are often the uh, the victims of some terrible anti-Semitic stereotyping during uh, the ramp up to World War II, and even during it, when we turned a deaf ear to what was happening to the Holocaust, that Jewish Americans uh, participated in the United States military at, at markedly higher numbers than any other ethnic group, as and I misspoke, than most ethnic groups because right up there were Japanese Americans who saw some of the most ferocious com combat. Senator Inouye, who recently died, was one of those. Um, so I don't have anything, we don't have anything from Japanese who were interned during World War II yet, but um, I'm really confident we're, we're looking 
and we're looking hard uh, to make that connection. The, we're tying our World War II veterans' uh, oral histories and profiles to the 70th anniversary of the end of World War II upcoming in uh, this summer in uh, August and September. Uh, sep August, late August for the Japanese, and in the spring uh, for the fall of the Third Reich. Other questions? Okay, well, I have really enjoyed myself, and I hope my scratchy voice is, is, hasn't been too off-putting. Uh, thanks for this opportunity, and I, uh, I'll just repeat our, our marching orders. Um, Help us. So many stories, so little time. Um, get a really good cheap tape recorder and uh, and start capturing those memories. Thanks very much. Thank you, John. Thank you. That was great. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today.